uh, listening to the introduction, and I'm very thankful for my mom writing that. Uh, traveling around the country is absolutely true. I'm looking at my week last week, and I'll be back on a plane uh, tomorrow. I really have been going around the country visiting with everyone. In fact, if you've been on a previous webinar of what we're talking about today, uh, it's changed. It is, it is a rapidly changing topic, a um, to changes in the 1003. Um, you're, you're going to learn a lot today, but there's still a lot that is going to possibly change uh, in the coming months, fall, uh, going into the next year. So as I talk about these Humda changes in the brand new 1003, some people say, Dave, this is the first I've heard about these changes. Why have we not heard about these changes before now? Well, uh, super easy. Uh, we were concentrating on something else called TRID. Think back to what we were working on October 2015. And October 2015, it was TRID. So who needs to report? This is changing. Pretty much everyone moving forward is going to need to report their new Humda data. How we're going to do that will be a topic of discussion today. But if your, uh, if your company had a main office or a branch office in an MSA, and an MSA is about 50,000 people, so think of your average football stadium. If you, if you had a, a main office or a branch office in an MSA and you close 25 loans or more, you now have to report where you may not have in the, back, in the past. Now, doing these webinars before with the wonderful folks at MGIC, we get questions, well, Dave, we're a small community bank or a small credit union or something. Do you need to report? If you meet these two guidelines, yes, you do. So let's do a little bit of history. In July of 2014, the CFPB proposed amendments to Reg C for the purpose of implementing the required changes included in Dodd-Frank. Now, let me, put a, let me just stop right here for just a second. One of the questions I get as I travel around the country is, Dave, isn't the current administration going to pass changes to Dodd-Frank? Did last week the Financial Choice Act affect some changes as it passed the House? Ladies and gentlemen, this is going to go into effect. If you're looking at your calendars, we're into June already. This goes into effect. January 1, 2018, if there are changes, and I think it's going to meet some resistance in the Senate, if there are changes, it is too soon for those changes to go into effect. So anything that may be going through the legislature right now probably is not going to get traction fast enough to, to affect us by January 1. So you need to have the mindset of this is going into effect. Now, the chip made affect the collection, the recording, and the reporting of additional info for purposes of HUMDA. So you have two federal laws, EQA and the Fair Housing Act, that prohibit discrimination. HUMDA tracks it, and it needs that data to see on, on tracking purposes if we are or are not discriminating. So what are, the, what are the amendments? Well, they fall into two general categories, the types of institutions that are subject to Reg C, and then the types of transactions that are subject to Reg C. Now, specific information that covered institutions, and remember now that this is more covered institutions that are required to collect, record, and report, and then process, which should begin this year, 2017, in fact, probably should begin in the next two to three months at the latest of what it is that we are collecting and how we're going to begin reporting it. For all the um, participants of this webinar today, you should already be way down the road as to what you're going to do to, um, to, to be in compliance January 1, 2018. So we're not going to start January 1. You need to start before that to make sure you're gathering everything in the new data fields. Now, talk about those data fields. There are changes uh, to the data fields that are either modified, existing, but there have been changes in the existing, or brand new data fields. 
And in data fields, um, you have data points and you have expanded areas, and over some of those things, expanded areas that are going to need to be covered. Now, the first thing I'm seeing as I'm going around the country is number one, the LEI or the Legal Entity Identifier. Ladies and gentlemen, do not have your legal entity identifier, would you please do that now? So the first question that pops up is, Dave, what is it? How do I obtain it? And I'm looking at Jeanette on the, on the, you know, um, on the chat. Where does one obtain the new required legal entity identifier? Jeanette, thank you so much for being proactive and paying attention and listening. Uh, let me help Jeanette and everybody else listening right now. So um, before I, I, I move to right now, just notice the red boxes, the universal loan identifier, you know, some things um, that you see on numbers one through five, and there are 48 changes. But let's go to, Je uh, let's go to Jeanette's question right now. The entity identifier an international standard that the U.S. is now going to adopt. It's a unique 20-character code that identifies the entity and all sub-entities of the main or parent entity. What does that mean? So let's say you are a, and um, Danielle, yes, you get a copy of the slideshow. You get everything. You get the recording. You get everything. So if you have a main office, and let's say you have 20 branch offices, let's say you have a main office and only seven branch offices, let's say you just have one main office, the LEI is for all of those entities under the parent entity. So each sub-office, each branch office, each, you know, every one of those will be different. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. That, that could be considered different will all be together aggregated into one LEI. So as of, I've got to update this, as of right now, June, I talked to many of you, you have not obtained it. So how do we obtain it? You can, you can go uh, just Google and type in LEI, or you can go specifically to Global LEI Foundation, so GLEIF.org, or the LEI Regulatory Oversight Committee, LEIROC.org. I do not run other entities. Why? I'm going to go backwards. Look at your slide deck. I'm going to go backwards because their description, look at the middle column, that light blue, that middle column. If the CFPB is recommending Global LEI or LEI Regulatory Oversight Committee, that is who we're recommending. All right? Now, if other entities provide it, that's great. But I'm only going to talk about what, um, what uh, the CFPB has recommended. It's recommended that you get your LEI sooner rather than later. Uh, there's a cost. The, the price is $200. And there's a convenience fee, $19, by the two entities we've already mentioned. So total of $219. And we don't think that there will be any price changes between now and the beginning of next year. However, you must have your 20-character, 20 20-digit 20 LEI code before January 1, 2018. Look back to the data fields that are changing. So uh, we did one through five. Six through nine have been modified. Number 12, property address. Now, we're sitting there saying, how is that new? We've always had the property address. Well. It's changed on the new 1003 is, is there's not even a space to include legal description. So we talk about a legal description. Um, most of the folks, as I go around the country, depending on where in America you are, will either say, see the preliminary title report, see prelim, see PR. Uh, nobody actually types in the legal description. And if you're in more rural America with meets and bounds descriptions, it's pretty lengthy, and there's no way to add it on. So um, it, if, if um, we used it, why do we have a spot for it? In the new 1003, there is not even a spot for um, the, pro the legal description. Now look down at the bottom of the screen on the left-hand side, 16, 17, and 18, ethnicity, race, and gender. It has been greatly expanded. 
So on this list from the CFPB, we're just seeing, well, um, you know, ethnicity, race, gender. Well, we're already familiar with those. We have those. Ladies and gentlemen, it's one data point that I covered today, but as you expand it, it is, it is much more encompassing than what we've done in the past. And we'll give you some examples. There, we don't have time short uh, hour, hour and 15, um, to visit with you on all the expanded data fields. So we'll just have to give you a, 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 a just a quick summary over everything that's going on. So 18 through 27, you, we have some, um, uh, if you look at the center uh, 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 where it says status, and you down the, the fields that I've uh, boxed in red, age, new. Well, we've always collected age. Well, that's going to be different as well. So as we go through these, and we don't have time on this webinar to go through every single one of them, um, I'm showing you the data points on the left-hand side, number 28 through 37, number 38 through 45, and then finally wrapping up, number 46 through 48. There are a lot of um, either changes or modifications or things that are considered new. Um, Julie says, I've had issues with my Eastern Indian customers because there has not been a field for their ethnicity before. Julie, there are now five data fields for individuals to either self-identify or for the institution to identify. And is Eastern Indian is one of the changes. So an angel institution, you know, Julie, that was a perfect segue for me to go into the in, in, into explaining um, what I just said by five data fields: one general data set, and then four specific data sets for a total of five. When a financial institution requests ethnicity, race, and sex information for an applicant, it must offer the applicant the option of selecting more than one ethnicity. Like, as you look across America, we now have mixed ethnicities, and they may be very, very proud of, you know, their heritage, which may be a mixture of several wonderful uh, ethnic backgrounds. So um, we have the one general, and we have four subcategories. Let me be specific. So, for example, if a borrower says, he is Hispanic or Latino, you have in the new 1003 pre-populated boxes that, that the person can check, either being Mexican, Puerto Rican, Cuban, or their Hispanic or Latino um, uh, uh, choices, selections. But if our borrower is Brazilian, well, now what do we do? So um, the new 1003 look at and have blank lines for people to fill that out. Now, let's, let's do a little bit of, uh, of housekeeping here. So notice the date. This is from Fannie Mae, May 30th, so not even two weeks old. This information came out from Fannie talking about that the, um, the CFPB published a final rule amending Reg C, to amendments to Humda, exactly what we're talking about today. The final rule modified the portable data requirements related to the collection of bar ethnicity, race, and gender. Others are required to collect the new and amended borrower demographic information on 1003 on applications taken on or after January 1, 2018. Next month, on the weekend of July 29th, when the updates due to 10.1, all right, when they update it, it will be able to um, complete the additional HUMDA requirements required by the CFPB uh, for January 1 implementation deadline and that need to be reported by March 31st, 2018. So getting back to our borrower who said he or she was Brazilian, is new demographic information on the new 1003. So if you look at the first box on the top left where it says ethnicity, Hispanic or Latino, 
out. Then I talked about the pre-populated boxes of Mexican, Puerto Rican, or Cuban. But remember, our borrower said that they were Brazilian. If you get the second longer box, it has a blank line. This is where we will enter Brazilian. Now, before I leave this page, uh, notice the, th uh, the three yellow arrows where under ethnicity, I do wish to provide this information. Go from top down to gender, I don't wish to provide this information. Or on the right-hand side, race, I don't wish to provide this information. The borrower can say, I don't want to tell you. So let's look at this. What if the applicant states, I do not wish to provide this information? Now what do we do? Well, in today's world, if it's a face-to-face -face visit, we have to look at them by either a visual observation or maybe the last name or maybe an accent or somehow we're going to have to guess. Now, if done by telephone, internet, fax, some other way that's not face-to-face, -face, we were okay in saying, well, hey, it wasn't face-to-face, -face, I don't have to guess. That is changing, changes. Info is collected by visual observation or surname, the financial institution must select from the aggregate or general category, not the disaggregated or specific categories. If financial institution collects the applications for electronic media with video component, this is considered a live face-to-face -face, and you must guess. Now, we have several wonderful financial institutions, larger financial institutions, online right now with us. They have multiple branch offices, and they'll have a loan officer sitting in one office that may service five or six branches. And the borrower, the customer coming into the bank, would sit at a kiosk looking at a video screen. The one loan officer is remote. And that's how they can handle five or six branches. And they're visiting with the person via a video screen. That video screen is now considered to be face-to-face -face and in-person. Now, what happens if it really, really is by mail, internet, or telephone, and the borrower says, I don't want to tell you. Please note the differences now. If a person comes into the financial institution to complete the application, the financial institution is required to request the information when they meet in person. If the applicant does not provide the requested information during the in-person meeting, you're processing the loan. The financial institution must make the determination based on observation or surname. If asked if application was begun via those um, mail, internet, telephone, fax, you understand they were fine. But if during the process you visually observe the, the applicant, they come into the office and you've got to uh, make, a, make a determination. If the first and only time uh, the applicant is seated in front of you is at signing, or as CFPB calls it consummation, that is the only time where it is not required. You are not required to obtain the information. The federal institution is required to not only collect sex, ethnicity, and race, also to report it. And this goes down to the five areas that we mentioned before, the one general category and the four subcategories for a total of five categories. Now, as we were looking at that list and we saw age, we said, well, Dave, we've always required, you know, we always needed to report age. Well, moving forward, January 1, 2018, Let's look at this example. The first birth date is January 15, 1970. You are making the application after New Year's, January 2, 2018. Just for laughs and giggles, guess what number are you going to put for this applicant's age? Correct, sir? 47. Why? Because that's what their whole year's worth of age was when they applied, not, you know, uh, less than two weeks later when they're going to turn 48, you need to put the age at the time of application. Do you have report income 
on a uh, credit decision? The answer is, yes, you do. If a decision was made, what was the income? Now, let's follow up. What income, net or gross? Answer, what we've always had in the past was gross income. Let's look at another one. Application channel, except for purchase covered loans, a financial institution must report both of the following not the applicant or borrower submitted the application directly to the financial institution, or not the obligation arising from the covered loan or application was or would have been initially payable to the financial institution. Some uh, attendees on today's webinar may have origination channels that are not all retail. Some of you have origination channels that are not just retail, but maybe wholesale not retail or wholesale, but correspondent. So did the borrower come to you directly or was it via another channel? Now on pre-approvals, the financial institution must report whether or not the application or covered loan involved a pre-approval request for a home purchase loan under a pre-approval program. You're, you're going to also need to list the loan type. Was it FHA? Was it VA? Was it rural housing, RD or USDA? Or was it something that was not insured or guaranteed? What would that be? Well, that would be conventional, where they would have gone to, for example, MGC for MI. You're going to need to not only list the loan type, but also the loan purpose. Was it purchase? Was it a home improvement? Was it a refi? Was it a cash out refi? Was it an other? Well, that would be an other. An other would be a combination of maybe a purchase and home improvement. Say, for example, an FHA 203K or if you may home style. So was it a refi in a home improvement? So these, it's going to be a lot more specific moving on in the future as to what types of loans and, um, you know, more detailed information, which, in humble opinion, I think is going to cause problems in the future. And I think it's going to cause problems. Um, maybe I'll let you, uh, let you flesh this thing out as the problems I see going on in the future. And um, I'm going to share them with you if we have enough time at the end. Uh, loan term, we to know, do we report in years or months? Is it years or 360 months? Everything I'm talking about is pertaining to the new information moving forward January 1, 2018. If you're looking at your calendars, that is less than six months from today. Um, what if it's a HELOC? Do you list years or months? And HELOCs have a start and end date. Uh, they have a draw period, but they also have a repayment period where you do have to pay off the HELOC and to leave you on pins and needles where we will always disclose months to move forward. Uh, the action must be reported as one of the following. What did you do? Was the loan originated? Was it approved but not accepted by the borrower? Was the application denied or withdrawn? ECOA, did you close the file because of incompleteness? The loan purchased. Was the pre-approval request denied? Was pre-approval request approved but not accepted? If it was denied, what was the reason? And you can list up to four reasons. Again, ECOA tells us that we can list up to four. Dave, why only four? Because after four, it just really doesn't do any good. If you're on the bar where you don't have a job, you have a 301 credit score, you know, you um, don't have a down payment for, a, for the program that requires a down payment, whatever the reasons are, after four times, uh, the borrower gets it. Okay, they don't qualify. You can stop. Now, they'll drill down to census tracts. Now, let me know the difference between an MSA and a census tract. If you, again, had a main office or a branch office in an MSA, you are required to report. MSA is 50000 But thus, if we don't have legal description, what we have? We have sense tracks. So we're putting the property address and the location of the property by state, county, and census tract. 
Now, a census tract is as small as 4,000 people. So now we're starting to get very, very, very specific. Let's go on. You're also going to need to report the um, total DI. So you have a housing or a back end or total DTI. What did you have as a CLTV? And then in credit, reporting must include the scores, the name, and the version of the scoring model used to generate each reported score. Ladies and gentlemen, you're sitting there breathing deeply and thinking, okay, I've got about six months, actually a little less, to get you for these humda changes. Actually, you have changes going on before that. For example, you have credit report changes that are happening less than 30 days. On July 1, 2018, you got credit score changes that are happening where items of public information such as liens and judgments may not be reported. You have in DU 10.1, Fannie has said, you know what? We're going to go ahead and ignore disputed accounts. Now, I'm oversimplifying, of course. You're going to need to read the release notes on Fannie's changes that are going on. But um, keep your seatbelts fastened. The next six months or less are going to be uh, some significant changes. Now, it's not as bad as what we had to change in TRID. Still, there are some changes going on. And if this is the first time you've, got, you've heard what? Credit are changing? Credit reports are changing July 1? DU 10.1 is going to go to a 50% back in DTI. What? Dispute accounts do not need to be resolved and items of public information like liens and judgments won't be reported. If this is the first time you're hearing these things, we're glad you're with us today because, my goodness, the landscape is changing. All right, the financial institution needs to report an interest rate that was approved. Obviously, if it was denied, there's no interest rate involved. You're going to need to report non-amortizing features, such as interest-only payments, NAM, balloons, other contractual terms that will allow for payments other than fully amortizing payments. There will be additional data points. Those additional data points talk about loan costs, Total points and fees, bar pay that origination charges, or the discount points, or lender credits, prepayment penalty, if any. HOEPA, I pronounce it HOEPA, so there's no um, confusion between HOPA, Homeownership Protection Act, and HOEPA, Homeownership and Equity Protection Act, or anything over the APOR. The mortgage loan originator identifier will still be on there, as well as your entities. LS number. So FBI is not the same thing as your NMLS ID number. Your mortgage call report is not the same thing as these HMDA changes. So whenever you see green, you know it comes from the CFPB. So looking at uh, the 2017 columns, oh, that was under the current rule. But over to the uh, column that's labeled a 208, uh, uh, 2018, year 2018. So go down that column to see uh, quarter one and quarter four, 2018 data as required under the new rule. We have to start collecting this information. That you need to start probably fall, may at the latest winter 2017, to ensure that your systems are set up and in place in order to get this information. Now, HUMDA shows that out of the 12 million applications, only 7.4 million resulted in an actual mortgage. This information is from 2015. We don't have the HUMDA data for 2016. That will come out in September. It shows that Black, Hispanic, and Asian borrowers were rejected at a higher rate than white. And what, what CFPB is trying to do is figure out why. Now, since we've talked about and seen the new data points that will begin to be reported, you're thinking, wow, that is a lot of new specific information that we use to identify the borrower. And if you're thinking that, 
you're thinking the same way I'm thinking, and that makes me very, very nervous. For data collected, the CFPB says, wait, 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 we're going to use a balancing test. When industry has asked the CFPB, show us this balancing test. Tell us this information, because with Internet and the search capabilities of Humda, the online search tool of Humda, you can start to drill down, not from you know, all of America, but you can start to drill down between 4,000 people in a census tract by age, by ethnicity, race, gender, credit score, income, loan amount, um, the loan type. So industry concerns is you can zero in on that particular borrower that we just did a loan for. Now, the CPB says, we will give you more information, but as of June, today, we haven't seen it. So hopefully, and summer, fall, at the latest, hopefully, CPB will give us more information. They say that at a later date, and here we are, mid-2017, the bill will provide a process for the public to provide input regarding the application of this balancing test. Well, if we in the industry didn't know all of these changes going on, how is the public going to input on something that they probably don't know about? The CB publishes the Humda data every September, and they also have that Humda, that online Humda tool. Now, what I did is I said, okay, 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 hang on. Let's overlay some of these tools that are available online, for example. The National Mortgage Database is separate, but joint project between the CFPB and Fannie and Freddie, their regulator, FHFA. Now, this is in the works, and it will also house a, um, the ability to give a lot of loan-specific uh, data and possibly personally uh, specific identifying data, which is cause for concern. Let's go to the great state of, of New York. There are online county record systems, such as the one used in the five boroughs of New York City, called Automated City Register Information System. And if we start overlaying all of these systems on top of these, uh, on top of what Humda is trying to do, I think we're going to be able to, with the increased amount of data sets, be able to identify pretty much the property its owner. So let's to the 1003 as we're, you know, rapidly running out of time. If you're tasked with creating a new 1003, what would you change? Think about it for half a second, and I'll give you the answer that America has told me as I've traveled around America. Get rid of legal description. Okay, your wish is granted. Two, why do we even ask about automobiles? That's eliminated. I like what Sandy is saying. Remove years in school. Well, Sandy, if they have student loan debt, okay, about a degree. Okay, a degree gives obviously borrowers more earning power. So, he, I, no, thank you for answering the question. Good job. Um, we're going to go into the 1003 and we're going to see some things that have been removed and changed. Like, for example, Sandy, um, a lot of borrowers did not complete the old 1003. Because one of the very, very first questions, if you guys just think about the current 1003, it talked about dollar amount, each rate, term, loan type, you know, program, and the just stopped before putting all that out, thinking, wow, I know I'm to be pre approved. I don't know how much I qualify for, I don't know what interest rates are going at. And maybe they put in what they heard on the internet or a radio ad or something. So for um, loan-specific information, it isn't until Section 4 where we ask loan amount and things. So the new 1003 is rewritten in a way that I absolutely really like. So there's, there, we need areas to collect cell phone and email information. And why well, didn't care about a fax machine? And you also notice that, as I already mentioned, the dollar amount, rate, 
term mortgage type has all been moved. The gentleman, this, well, see, there's that drum roll, the teaser, this year, nah, not quite a new 1003. Let me give you a little bit of history. <clears throat> With the new 2015 Humda rule, the decision by both GSEs, Fannie and Freddie, to take a look at the 1003. December 2015, Fannie and Freddie announced they'd be revising and redesigning the 1003. This should not be a surprise to the industry. You knew, you knew for a year and a half that they were doing a new 1003. Well, why would they need to do that? One, it hasn't been updated for 20 years. Two, the way that we collect information now is not like the way we did 20 years ago, so it provides greater clarity, even more consumer friendly, easier for online, so this 1003 will expand and contract depending on how it is filled out. It's also meant to assist lenders to collect data more easily. The new three had hence, an effective date of January 2018. Wait, whoa, 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 date, what? You're supposed to collect this new Honda stuff. The new 1003 has all of the fields, the areas where I can collect it, but I'm required to use it? Ladies and gentlemen, the effective date was removed because it caused confusions over when the form may be used and it would be mandated for use. So, the updated footer to the new 1003 now reads, quote, not for current use. And it will be updated once the GSEs align on a mandate date for the use of the form. Okay, I'm confused. If I have to start collecting the new Humda data January 1, but I don't have the form, it's not required for me to use, now what do I do? Well, to um, give you the ending before you know we, we share the whole story, you use part the new 1003 on January 1, 2018, and the whole 1003. Well, that now creates other problems because how are you going to, with your current loan origination system, your current reporting, how are you going to gather all of the new information required January 1, 2018 if you don't have the form Put it on. So hopefully through summer, fall, stay tuned to you know NGIC presentations and stuff. We will give you an update as soon as we hear something. Now, so having said that, the new requirements do go into effect. And one page of the new 1003 will be used to collect the Honda data. We'll show you how this is to be reported later on in the presentation. There are two separate parts of the new 1003, which you had a single borrower, nine pages. That's the Government Paperwork Reduction Act in, in full effect right there, guys. Okay, we take a three or four page 1003, and we now make it a nine page 1003 on a single borrower. Our seven pages, that's the borrower information portion. There are two pages for the lender information portion. Now, there is important information regarding how to complete the new 1003, and these instructions can be found on the URL you see in red on your screen right now. I, I, we are giving you just a ton of information. Uh, please understand it is being recorded. You're going to get the complete slide deck. We have our staff right now, our, uh, we have our compliance attorney and others that are answering your questions as you ask them. So, uh, Julie again asks, can you repeat how many pages on the new 1003, Julie, for single borrower? I didn't a co-borrower. There are nine. Okay. Denise asks, how does the LEI number affect our loan number? If I was to go back, Denise, and I'm sorry, I'm not going to go back, you're going to have a loan number, and you're going to have, which is a loan-specific, loan specific, and you're going to have your LEI for reporting purposes, which is an aggregate, okay? 
Uh, will an example of the new 1003 be released within this webinar? Ask Sherry. Sherry, your wish is granted. Boom. Here is your new 1003. Now, Sherry, I don't want to go over the information that we all know, name, social. I, I, we know that. We don't have time. Okay? So I'm just highlighting the things that are different. Okay? So you look. Uh, uh, at your current, if you lay the current 1003 and the new 1003 side by side, notice up at the top, there's no checkbox, there's no signatures, there's no loan type, amount, months, amortization, there's nothing like that. It just starts off in some one borrower information. So um, on this one, notice the red box on the uh, bottom left hand side. Oops, it's too fast, sorry. Talks about married, then the circle there, said a circle there, and unmarried, and the circle there, right? So you see single, divorced, widowed, civil union, domestic partnership, registered reciprocal beneficiary relationship. The world looks up at you and asks, what's that? One thing that we do not want to say as professionals is, what we've done is we've given you the definitions of those right here, and it's not what you think. When you when you say when you're looking at that single divorce widowed civil union domestic partnership, oh, those are same gender uh, marriages. No, they're not. Look at domestic partnership. Either one of an unmarried look at the next word heterosexual or homosexual cohabitating couple. Ooh, see, it's not what you thought. The registered reciprocal beneficiary relationship, it is not what you think. A little relationship created when two consenting adults who are prohibited from marriage. As we this live, well, my hand shoot up. And they say, Dave, you prohibit two consenting adults from marriage. Um, yes, you can. What if mother and daughter? What if aunt and niece, uncle or nephew? Do you get it? So it is not what you think it is. I'm going to go backwards to help you guys. Looking at the bottom left-hand side, are they legally married? Are they legally separated? If they are not legally married or legally separated, goes into the unmarried uh, session. On this side, contact information, as we mentioned. These are definitions. Let's move on. Description is no longer part of this. Look at the bottom left on military service. This area of the 1003 has been expanded. So check yes to all that apply. Are you currently serving, currently retired? You were in a non-activated Theater. There wasn't a war going on, maybe part of the Reserve or National Guard. Do you have a surviving spouse? Or are you a surviving spouse? Sorry. Do you have any means you've passed away? Sorry about that. So the next one, let's look at these different colored arrows. The left-hand side, the red one. Check who are the business owner or self-employed. The borrower may say, I get a W-2. Yeah, but if they're the business owner owning 25% or more of the entity, well, in underwriting, we're going to need to collect business tax returns. Now you have to think about it. It's on the 1003. Go up to yellow. Check the statement applies. I'm employed by a family member, property seller, real estate agent, or other party to the transaction. Oh my goodness, a lot more clarity. Go to the top right, the purple arrow. Go down that column. Do you see where it says military entitlements? So notice dividends, interest, net rental income, or Military entitlements have been added, and as we go around our circle, what about alimony, child support, or separate maintenance? Now, there are many of your staff, your frontline loan officers that, that do not know, you cannot ask as it pertains to income. Look at the top black tab. This is income, 1B. They can ask about alimony, child support, or separate maintenance. If it's for income, we not ask. ECO prohibits us from doing that. Now, when we do ask it, it's because of a liability. 
the borrower or co-borrower have to pay alimony, child support, or separate maintenance? Now, that's a totally different question. And we don't have time for me to give you a more in-depth. Um, just again, you have to be very, very careful. But the new 1003 helps us with that a lot. Let's go to one, we're in 1B, 1C. If you're the owner for previous. Now, this is what I meant by look at 1E. Now we point or direct the borrower's attention to in from other sources. Now we say, hey, do you have income from another source? So the borrower might, might ask, well, what sources? We can direct them to this section. You can the box, you can look where it says note. Reveal alimony, child support, separate maintenance, or other income only if you want to consider it in determining your qualification. Once the borrower opens the door, we can walk through it, but we cannot grab the handle and open, you know, some front door. You just can't do that. If they open the door and invite us in, they open the door to tell us about alimony, child support, or separate maintenance. Now we can talk about it. So the new 1003 totally in compliance with ECOA, because you have to be assigned off on it, and they're the regulator over ECOA. They're saying we are okay with it being listed this way. Let's move on to Section 2. In A, it talks about financial information, assets and liabilities. So we can ask about these different things, and by asking for more assets, it may help us on our DU approvals. Yes, I am speeding up because I'm looking at the time scene that we're running out. Um, B, any other assets that they might have, and notice automobiles are missing. To B, liabilities. Uh, it's the box, leases, but not on real estate. Well, Dave, what other leases might there be? Maybe mobiles? So you need to look at your uh, underwriting guidelines on do you count leases on vehicles that have less than four, six months on them. So if there's going to return the lease, do you count the lease payment for ETI purposes? That's, that's a decision each entity will need to make. As we move on to 2D, and their liabilities, this is where you have alimony, child support, separate maintenance, job-related expenses. In 3A, financial information on real estate, it is still a 75% income um, on uh, leases, uh, sorry, rentals, because, again, 25% for vacancies, for advertising, for repairs, things like that. In section 4, now... Now is where we finally come into uh, the loan amount. The, see, so the borrower is invested now. They've gone all the way to section four on this 1003 before we're asking them some questions on loan amount, property address, and the occupancy. Is it primary residence, second home investment property, or FHA secondary residence? No mixed use and manufactured. We're seeing Fannie and Freddie now do an emphasis on more manufactured. So those new questions have been answered. Few rental income, gifts or grant money, where is it coming from? And again, is it a relative? Is it an employer? Is it a nonprofit? Again, I'm going through these things very, very quickly because I'm trying to be mindful of your time. Declarations page. This was the page that had the, um, the yes and no questions. You guys Remember the yes and no questions of the borrower have, having to answer yes and no and the co having to answer yes and no. We had A through M. The A and M questions are still the number of questions, but I want, to, I want to look at the first five questions, A through E, and not only what is being asked, but why are those questions being asked. Let's look at them. A, I'm just reading the underlying part, again, trying to be mindful of your time. Would you occupy the property as your primary residence? This sort of stops those borrowers that mm, may be looking at it as non-owner occupied, but they say it's owner occupied for the low rate. B, if they purchase transaction, do you have a family relationship or business affiliation with the seller of the property? Are you borrowing any money for this real estate transaction from another party, such as the seller, real that you've not disclosed on this loan application? D, or will you be applying for a mortgage loan 
loan on another property before closing this transaction that is not disclosed on this loan application. And the E, will this property be subject to a PACE lien that will priority over the first mortgage? I'm Ohio teaching this class to Ohio MBA. I mentioned PACE. They looked at me and said, what's loan? As across America, and I see this mostly on the sand states, Florida, California, and then as you go to Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, you have these solar companies that are putting solar panels on people's homes. And doing that, they're telling the, the people there is no mortgage on your property. So preliminary title report is pulled, no mortgage is shown. For in executive or administrative positions, you need to be careful because this is put on with the property taxes, and property taxes are the only lien that can be superior to a first mortgage. We're not even asking the questions. In this purchase environment, you have the seller have put on twenty, thirty thousand dollars of solar panels, but it does not show up as a lien but absolutely in a superior position to our first mortgage. And that is a problem. So to solve that problem, and if you weren't even aware of it until just now, again, we appreciate MGIC for giving us a platform to share this with, with you. Um, you have MBA and 27 national and state industry trade groups joint send letters to the House and Senate in support of Senate Bill 838 and House Bill 1958, and they're using the same acronym, PACE, protecting Americans from credit entanglements, we would require these, these solar, I'm just picking out solar as an example, salespeople to do the same thing that we have to do. We have to you know, disclose the TILA requirements or the TILA disclosures, including the CFPB's ability to, ability to repay and know before you owe rules. So we're trying to make it a level playing field that the consumer understands exactly what they're getting into when, for example, take these solar panels. I need to move on. We're, we're running out of time. So um, about your finances, and through M, some of these things are have been modified a little bit. Look at letter K. This is new. In the last seven years, have you completed a, a pre-foreclosure sale? Whereby the property was sold to a third party for less than the uh, outstanding balance, or in other words, short sale. Let's continue on. The wording has been changed to the acknowledgement and agreement. This is right above the signature line. In the current 1003, there are 11 things that the bar was acknowledging and agreeing to when they signed it. It's now been changed to six, from 11 down to six. But I want you to notice the change in the wording. The borrower is now saying, I and me. So very, very specific to the borrower that they understand they are the ones uh, agreeing to these things. Here is the current 1003 that we're used to looking at. It's very limited space. Now, this is for the borrower and co-borrower. On the next slide, it will just be the borrower. Look how this area has been expanded. Ethnicity, left-hand side, race, right-hand side, ethnicity, general category, race, much more specific. Nominator information completes the seven pages of the 1003. The two pages are lender-specific. Our community property state. Give me the transaction detail or property type. Moving right, the refinance type, refinance program, energy improvement. Uh, we don't have time to go into details into all of these. Uh, next part will be the estate will be held in fee simple or leasehold. The man in which title will be held. Trust information. In the country land tenure. Uh, if it's an adjustable rate, and I do see in the future more adjustable rates happening. Um, if you haven't migrated over to adjustable rates, if rates continue to rise, and home prices uh, continue to rise out of the reach of first-time home buyers, which is the largest market segment buying homes right now. You're seeing a migration more to an adjustable rate. 
I've got uh, loan features. And remember, are they non-amortizing loan features? Details of transaction on this and on the next slide. So there's A through H. And then we uh, continue. Uh, we'll go into L5, L meaning lender. Go through home ownership counseling, you know, uh, first time home buyers, things like that. The August 2016 Fannie and Freddie published the redesigned 1003. So it's been around now for a few months. Allow the industry sufficient time to begin the analysis and playing whenever that is, the future 1003. So all of us need to be in the mode to get ready for it. And, um, and I think you're going to see some more information very, very, very shortly. September 2016, the CFPB issued a notice of Bureau official approval of the 1003 as being a safe harbor for use under ECOA. Ladies and gentlemen, I have gone as fast as I can uh, but try to give you some details on on how to um, how to um, interpret or understand or why the changes have been going on. I see on the right hand side we have had many questions, and our staff has tried to answer as many questions as you can. Uh, get a copy of this uh, presentation. A magic will GIC will make it available to everyone as well as a recording. If we did not get to your questions, or once you've had time to research um, the presentation, the new 1003, Honda, uh, if you still have questions, questions after the webinar can be submitted to MGICweb at mortgageeducators.com. Roxanne, thank you. I've tried to take something super complex and turn it into English. So, Roxanne, when you say thank you, very informative. Um, it, it puts all the hard work and effort that we do on our part and to try and deliver a product that's, that's very, very superior. The, uh, we, try to, we, we try to do the best that we can. Jan Janet, thank you. We, we try really, really hard. But if you still have questions, please ask us. Uh, at this point, uh, again, I think it's only, we only have an hour, so we have about six minutes. Um, I want to uh, let JC know that we're going to turn the controls back over to them. Any final questions that we have? I'm trying to trying to see. Oh my goodness! Sorry about that, Barb. Barb was in a webinar, ended up in a meeting that went way over, missed the 45 minutes. Barb, we want you to get it. So yes, it's recorded, and I see we'll let everyone know how we can do that. Uh, Stacy, oh that one was already answered. Denise, we already answered that one. Nancy, we got that. One. And Janet, ladies and gentlemen, any other questions? As we sign off, we're going to give you like 60 seconds for other questions. Info. Thank you. We tried. Thank you. If if um, I'm kind I'm kind of a I'm kind of a shy guy. You can't tell, um, but I I am. And uh, you guys are uh, touching my heart. Uh, heart, Julie. Hi. Wow. Um, Julie, I don't see where it is. East, Eastern Indian fits into all those. Eastern Indian would be Asian, Julie. The e Eastern Indian are Asians. Say thank you. Well, seeing that all you guys are doing is making me feel good, I think, Julie, they don't fit into white. Uh, no, they don't. Okay, uh, let me turn the controls back over to NGIC. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your time and your uh, information. Of Hi, do we ask our corporate staff about the LEI? Yes, do now, please. Uh, MG MGIC, we turn the controls back over to you. Everybody, have a good week. Dave Luna, I'm done. David, thank you so much, and thank you, David's team as well, for answering all the questions um, promptly. The recording will be available at MGIC's training page uh, before the end of this week, so stay tuned for that. Um, any additional questions, like Devin mentioned, can be directed to MGIC web at mortgageeducators.com. So thank you, everyone, and have an excellent day.